I'm Elizabeth, I'm a literary princess, and today I am talking about my top 10 nonfiction books. So November is Nonfiction November, which is a event hosted by a book olive, and the idea is to read nonfiction in November. I am participating, I'm reading, <laughs> what am I reading? I'm reading stuff about new women writers um, and just other Victorian women writers. I'm reading some feminist theory, and I also read Confessions of an English Opium Eater. <laughs> but I thought that I would talk a bit today about the 10 nonfiction books that I just really would consider top tier favorites. And I'm not really going to go in any specific order until right at the end because <laughs> A, I don't have half of my books with me because my nonfiction mostly lives on campus in my office and I was not lugging, <laughs> I was not lugging books back. I do enough of that already. But so I have maybe four or five that are here physically and then I have a bunch that are on campus that I'll just put up a picture. So I'm going to talk about the books that I have here first and then I'll talk about the ones that I don't have here or that I don't own because I think there's at least one in there that I don't own. Um, but probably the last two or three books will be like my favorite favorites but otherwise I can't really um, rank them because they're all so different. Like you're, you're gonna see in a minute these are very different books until like the last three and then they're literary biographies and I'll give you three guesses on who they are and the first two guesses don't count. Anyway, let's jump right into it. So the first one I want to talk about is The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. I read this, oh, earlier this year, I guess it was, for my Women, Gender, and Health class. It was the first book we read. Wow. So this is the story of Henrietta Lacks, um, a woman in the, I don't remember now when it was. It was in the 50s, I think. She had cancer. She went in to get treated and the doctors took her cells and they ended up finding that these cells were able to multiply on their own. So they started using them to do all kinds of tests. They started selling them all without her permission, all without her knowledge. She got no money from it. She ended up passing away. And her family tried to get some some rights. And this is just, Rebecca Sklut is telling Henrietta's story, but also the story of her remaining family members and also the story of the medical world and everything that these cells have been used for. It's so fascinating very emotional, very upsetting. The, the whole class made me just terrified of any medical treatment ever. But this was fantastic. Utterly loved how Sklut weaves in narrative with science and medicine and just is able to tell a very wonderful story that needed to be told. We did in class talk about like some issues of was this her story to tell? which there is that issue. Henrietta Lacks is a black woman. Rebecca Skloot is a white woman, I'm pretty sure. Yep, white, white woman. Um, so there was a question like, if, is this her story to tell? But ultimately I thought it was so good. Next up was for my graphic narrative class, which I took two years ago. And we're not going to talk about how long ago that was because, ew. But this is a graphic memoir. It is The Best We Could Do by T. Blee. Oh my god. I did, um, I did, I'm pretty sure a paper and a presentation on this and on her um, use of this kind of orange rust color. But anyway, so this is the story of um, the author and her family immigrating from Vietnam to America. And it's stunning. It is stunning. Holy crap. I love this. It was so good. Uh, so we've got the Vietnam War in here. We have some really intense scenes of them 
um, going over on a boat. So here I can kind of, yeah, and this whole book is done with this like red and the black. And I did, I did my paper and a project on that. But it's just so fantastic. <laughs> it's so good. It's all kind of framed by Bui giving birth to her first child. And it's all about generational trauma and how what the parents go have gone through then affects the children. It's just so good, okay? It, read this. It's so good. I loved it. And next up was for my memoir course three years ago. Ew. <laughs> um, and this is another graphic uh, memoir, even though it wasn't for the graphic narrative class. This is Fun Home by Alison Bechdel. I love this so much. <laughs> that's, that's just gonna be me about all of these books. Oh my God, I love it so much. Um, so this is the story of Alison Bechdel dealing with her father's death, um, finding out that her father is gay, and also realizing that she herself is gay. It's just fantastic. I love Bechdel's art so much. Like she has this very cartoony style, but then she can also do super photorealistic stuff. Let me see if I can find one of them here like she is able to redraw these photographs in a very realistic style compared to her usual drawing style it's just so good oh my god i adored this i wrote my final paper for the class on it um on trauma <laughs> okay there's just a lot of trauma in graphic narratives apparently um yes i wrote about trauma and how the act of drawing it is act, it works as like a healing mechanism anyway. I adore this, go check it out. I also really enjoyed her follow-up, um, Are You My Mother? which is focused on her relationship with her mother, um, but I didn't like it as much as Fun Home. Next up is a little bit of a change of pace. This is Graduate Study for the 21st Century, How to Build an Academic Career in the Humanities by Gregory Semenza. Uh, this was recommended to me early on in my program and so I picked it up and read it and wow it was so helpful. I actually I need to reread parts of it about um, just exams. Oh yes about exams. <laughs> I should have read that ages ago. I mean I did read it like three years ago though at the beginning of my program. This just it has like everything you need. Um, the culture of a graduate program, the structure of your graduate career, organization and time management, the graduate seminar, the seminar paper, teaching, exams, the dissertation, attending conferences, publishing, service and participation, and the job market. It's like just everything you need to know. And it's so helpful. I need to reread it. So yeah, if you are in a PhD program or considering going into a PhD program, highly recommend this. I will warn you, it can be a bit of a bleak outlook, but that's kind of because <sighs> things are a bleak outlook. <laughs> what with the job market right now and just the culture of academia being what it is, but super helpful. And this is one that I read last year, I think. This was actually assigned to me by my doctor. Um, this is Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle by Emily and Amelia Nagoski. And so, yeah, hi, I've, I'm experiencing burnout like constantly. I struggle with anxiety, which is part of why my doctor recommended this because she thought I would find some of it very useful and I did find it incredibly useful. Lots of useful coping mechanisms, but also just talking about why we get burned out. This is specifically geared toward women. So, but I think men can probably find some, some helpful stuff in here, but I just, and the, like a lot of this stuff is probably stuff other people know already, but I didn't. 
So I just found it really helpful and it, yeah, I'm glad my doctor assigned it. Now we get into the ones that I do not physically have with me. So first up, I want to talk about Paying the Land by Joe Sacco. This was another one for my graphic narrative class. It is, um, how do I describe this? <laughs> Aside from it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. So it's kind of like a piece of investigative journalism, really. So Sako went and spent time with the Diné tribe in the Mackenzie River Valley up in Canada. Um, they are a native tribe and he is getting just kind of their accounts of what's going on. There is um, fracking going on up there and different people within the tribe have very different opinions on it. They, there was a lot of talk about the, um, the schools that the, um, I guess they're the residential schools that were quite abusive and that basically just kind of kidnapped people's children and brought them there and tried to like make them Christian. And honestly, it's extremely traumatic. <laughs> It's an extremely traumatic book, but it's so beautifully done. I love Sacco's art, the way that he has just set up the whole book. It's quite long. It's like that thick and it's just gorgeous. It's stunning. Um, again, we had like the talk, like, is this his story to tell? Because he is not native. He's not Dene. He's not any other native tribe. But to me, as somebody who is not native and so can't really speak to it, but it did feel very respectful. He did his research. I mean, a lot of the parts of the book are framed as him interviewing people. And I don't know, it was just gorgeous. He did a paper on this too, and a presentation. Okay, I just did papers and presentations on the books that I liked, okay? <laughs> but I thought this was gorgeous highly recommend it. Super informative too because I I knew about the residential schools here in the United States. I didn't so much know about the ones up in Canada and considering the um, recent findings that were happened, I know they, they found remains of, of a lot of children that had been in residential schools quite recently. So I think this is a really important and timely book. So, okay. Then we have On Writing, A Memoir of the Craft by Stephen King. This book is interesting because it's half memoir and half like practical writing advice. Stephen King is like my favorite modern author. I adore him. I've read this two or three times now, I think. And I've just really enjoyed it every time. I like learning about Stephen King's writing life because he takes us from his childhood into his adulthood, but with a real focus on him as a writer instead of just like his full life story. There is that stuff in there, but the development of a writer is really what interested me here, as well as the practical writing advice, which I think is the reason I originally picked it up as a middle schooler, <laughs> maybe. But it's just fantastic. It's so good. Stephen King's a good writer. So getting advice from him is, is great. Right, and now we are kind of moving into the ones where I have a little bit of an order, sort of, kind of, not really. These are all literary biographies. So first up, we are going to go with Margaret Fuller, A New American Life by Megan Marshall. Um, so I read this in undergrad for my senior year of undergrad for a paper on the 19th century American Renaissance. I did my final paper on Margaret Fuller and I was blown away by this book. I loved it. I hadn't read a lot of literary biographies at this point. Like I'd read pieces of some and like maybe one or two full ones 
but this was just, it was a story and I got so engaged. I would say, honestly, this is probably the book that kicked off my love for the literary biography genre. It was so good. Um, Margaret Fuller lived a really interesting life, really tragic death. I cried. This book made me cry. Okay. I don't, I don't cry during books usually. Like I can count them on maybe two hands, books that I've cried at. This book made me cry. It's so good. So beautifully written. I want to reread it. And actually, I have another Meghan Marshall book on um, the Peabody Sisters, Three Women Who Ignited American Romanticism that I need to read. I got halfway through it, but had to stop because I was busy, I think. <laughs> but Marshall is just such a good storyteller. And there was so much interesting stuff in here. I learned a lot about a writer that I didn't really know much about before. So, and like, usually I don't like American American writing until we get into like modern day. But um, I really enjoyed learning about Margaret Fuller. We're into the top three and they are all focused on the same people. <laughs> so first up we have The Bronte Myth by Lucasta Miller. This is a really interesting biography because what it's doing is breaking down all the misconceptions from previous biographies. So starting with the Life of Charlotte Bronte by Elizabeth Gaskell, and then going up through um, the Brontes by Juliet Barker, I'm pretty sure, and going through kind of how biographers have portrayed the Bronte sisters, what was correct, what was incorrect. And it was it's just such an interesting way of doing it. And I actually highly recommend reading this in like together with The Life of Charlotte Bronte because there are so many inaccuracies in that book, but like it's the first Bronte biography and it's very important and very beautifully written by the way. But the Bronte myth will help kind of unravel the inaccuracies and why they were made. This was fascinating. Loved it. And then we have Charlotte Bronte, A Fiery Heart by Claire Harmon. This is also known um, in the UK as Charlotte Bronte, A Life. I don't know why they felt the need to change the title. But this is a fantastic biography focused on just on Charlotte. Um, yeah, the little blurb says, places an obsessive, unrequited love at the heart of the writer's life story. So really focusing in on her um, feelings for Monsieur Hege. Um, but just a wonderful, absolutely wonderful biography of Charlotte. Finally, we have kind of the, the Bronte biography. This is The Brontes by Julia Barker. This is a biography of the whole family. We start with Patrick and him coming over to America, uh, to America, to the, to England from Ireland. And we go all the way through his marriage, them having their first two children, um, Elizabeth and Mariah, the Charlotte, Branwell, Emily, Anne, the older girls dying at school, um, then, you know, the part that we know best, the, um, the sisters writing the novels and Branwell's demise, the girls dying, all the way until Patrick's death. So, like, this is a really comprehensive look at this whole family, which I think is really important for understanding the Bronte sisters, because, like, they were this whole family, and things that their father did early on affected them, and things that their, I mean, the thing, everything with their sisters. Mariah is the basis for Helen Burns in Jane Eyre. Her death had a huge impact on Charlotte. So just going through the full family is so important, and Barker is so meticulous. She looks at so, just so much. Branwell's affair with Mrs. Robinson. <laughs> got all that in there. It is there. I just, it's, it's a phenomenal book. It never felt dry to me. It was just this great story and I got attached to them. 
so attached to them. I'm, did, I'm trying to remember if I cried during this one too. I might have. <laughs> but absolutely phenomenal work of nonfiction. Highly, highly recommend. It is long. Um, <laughs> the copy I have is, I think, 1,184 pages. So there is that. <laughs> but truly, if you're looking for the definitive work on the Brontes, this is it. And those are my top 10 nonfiction books. Ten, I think 10, it might be 11. Oops, I have no idea how many it is anymore. Well, however many it was, those are my top nonfiction books. Let me know down in the comments below. Have you read any of these? What did you think? What are your favorite nonfiction books? It has been great chatting with you all. Happy Nonfiction November. I will see you soon. Bye.